Today on Soul Zero Two, we look at the kind of ins insubstantial hope that the world offers and how it differs from the significant hope only found in God on Soul Zero Two. And welcome to Soul Zero Two. This is the podcast that is seeking to put the oxygen back into the Christian life one soul at a time. And uh, we believe that we are followers of Jesus. We're not just Christians, you know, in a political sense or in a philosophical sense. We believe that we are supposed to obey him and love him and give our lives to him. But uh, I want to talk about hope in this three-part series that we're looking at. And uh, this three-part series is, is uh, one of the main underpinnings of my life message. And I call it the art of waiting. And today, do you hope? Uh, do you have the right kind of hope? This is today's part. Do you have the right kind of hope? And there are many kinds of hope in the world. And in, in this series today, The Art of Waiting, uh, we use as a symbol the eagle, which in, in Isaiah 40 and verse 31 is, is a symbol of hope and waiting on God. And we also look at the idea that that we can actually have the wrong kind of hope if we're not careful and we can we can navigate in in a you know the way the world navigates and so how does the world navigate hope well the world has empty hope right and uh the epicureans which were one of the first people that uh you know to talk about this you know during the uh the ancient times they basically said the gods don't care things happen randomly and you have nothing to say about it. We are just atoms that will someday scatter when we die. And this is a very general, you know, description of, of what they said. But Lord Byron, he was uh, quite a character. And he basically said that hope is this cheap fake when he, when he said this. But what is hope? Nothing but the paint of face on the face of existence. The least touch of truth rubs it off. And then we see what a hollow-cheeked harlot we have got a hold of. Uh, he was a very positive kind of guy, if you notice by the writing. But uh, then Frederick Nietzsche saw hope this way. He basically saw hope as a fraud. He said, hope in reality is the worst of all evils because it prolongs the torments of man. And it was almost like a, a depressing way of looking at hope. Then we have people like Benjamin Franklin, how he saw hope. He basically said that hope sets you up for disappointment when he said this, he that lives upon hope will die fasting. Then there's the naive hope of the 70s commercials. If you remember those, those commercials, um, the 70s had kind of like this, this uh, basic, facile, oversimplified view of hope. Remember that Pepsi commercial that sang this song that said, I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony and all this, and all these people are happy and all these races are happy. And all this is, you know, is envisioned without God, which is impossible. Because of our nature, there will never be peace, there will never be unity, there will never be, there will never not be racism without God, because God is the only one who can fix it. Then if you've heard of the, the band Journey, uh, they give you the pop culture kind of hope in that famous song, Don't Stop Believing, Hold On to That Feeling, right? And then uh, there's hope in technology. And, you know, we see the Star Trek shows and all these shows that promise a great future, a utopian future of perfection. And this has been called the myth of progress, that one day technology will have conquered war, racism, disease, and poverty. And if you watch any of the Star Treks, uh, especially the next generation, it's like, well, they figured all that stuff out. And so... We only have time to explore now and, and be great. And, but I'm glad that some of the show kind of, they, they show the underside of when things don't work out, right? But think about if, if you really think that the hope of the world works, just look about, look at the past three years of what happened in the world. They remind us that as a race, that we fancy ourselves advanced and evolved but we fall embarrassingly short. And we find that, you know, the Ukraine war has been going on for what? Over two years now? 
Then we had the whole COVID debacle, the, that whole nightmare of, of just how many people died, how many people, and it wasn't just the COVID, but the aftermath of it. The politics that divided families and friends and churches and, and created movements uh, that are good and not so good. And so some hope in the best, some hope for justice, some hope for closure, some hope that maybe one day things will be different, things will be better. And yet others see hope as a slippery thing that you, you could never quite get a hold of. And all this, again, I describe as empty hope. Empty hope is the kind of hope that just doesn't really go anywhere. But what is the quality of our hope as, as the children of God? I want to read that scripture to you there. Isaiah 40, 31, my favorite scripture of all time. It says, But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. And this is the kind of hope we're talking about today. The kind of hope that, it, that is substantial, that is real, that has nothing to do with my own strength or bravado or animus, but with the power and possibility of God. That's true hope. So our hope is rooted in the God of hope. That's the key of it. It's not just rooted in better circumstances or in someday or, you know, there's an old saying, someday is, is not another day of the week, <laughs> um, or, or rather is, is, is not a day of the week. But uh, Paul, the apostle, declared this over the church in Rome when he said, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and in believing that so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So the object of our hope is the God of hope. It's, it's God himself. It's not our strength. It's not our evolved sense of purpose. It's not our myth of technology or our transhumanism idea that one day we're going to make human bodies better and all these things. And, you know, but it's, it, it's the God of hope. And this kind of hope has to be memorialized. What do I mean by that? Again, if you read Isaiah 40 and 28, it says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. There's something about this that when it grabs root in your heart, that you have to remember it and you have to realize this is what you're fighting out of. It's, it's not out of yourself. It's not out of your your sense of, of strength and power and empowerment, but it's out of His power. And two things that God reminds us in Isaiah 40 are, number one, that, that the everlasting God never tires, but also that God has called you and I to be an eagle. And that's Isaiah 40 and 31. So the Lord asks this rhetorical question in verse 28. When he says, don't you know, have you, haven't you heard? And he's talking to Israel who were well acquainted with the history of God, <clears throat> that God delivers, that God helps those who, who turn to him and who, who do the right thing, right? He doesn't just help anybody who doesn't obey him, but he helps people who submit to him and say, look, Lord, I, I give my life to you. This is what I mean. Um, he doesn't help people who choose evil. You know, he, he helps people who choose him. But on the other hand, he reaches out to people who are evil and hope that they'll change. So that, that's a whole nother story, right? He loves everybody, not just good people. He loves, he loves everybody, evil and good alike. But here's my point. Why does God ask rhetorical questions to his people who, who have a thorough history of who he is? Because we tend to become inoculated from even the most powerful truths. You can know something with the depths of your heart so well that you forgot that you know it, especially when you go through the fire. And waiting for long seasons can vaccinate us against, uh, uh, against truth, God's truth of who he is and who he says we are in him. And our hearing no longer becomes mixed with faith. And we begin floundering as we wait. And maybe you're watching this or listening to this today. Have you forgotten that God has called you to be an eagle? And I'll get into that today a little bit of, of how powerful an eagle is and what they're capable of doing. And the eagle serves as a symbol 
to God's people that we are meant to run and not be weary and walk and not faint. It doesn't mean we won't have problems, but it means that He will give us the power and the dexterity and the grace to navigate them. So Jesus asked a rhetorical question to a man who was blind. When he asked this question, he says, do you want to receive your sight? And to a person who is blind, that almost seems like a dumb question. But Jesus asked another question to a crippled man when he asked him this question. He says, do you want to be made whole? And this man was laying by a pool for 38 years. And Jesus knew that for 38 years, this man was floundering in his faith. So he had to ask him this rhetorical question. So our hope, and, and, and by the way, God asked these rhetorical questions because they build up faith again. He wants you to look at this again. He wants you to believe again. So we find that our hope is an agile hope. And what do I mean by that? Think about what, what an eagle represents. You know, and part of this is what I'm going to share is some of it is true, some of it is legend. And, and obviously the authors of, of the scriptures put it in there. You know, the, the Holy Spirit had them put it in there because sometimes we find truths in, in, in uh, you know, in things that, uh, in, in, in stories, right? In stories. But, uh, but eagles are swift. They, they, they are clocked at going very, very fast when they fly. And they can swoop down on their prey so quickly and so, so dexterously that the prey never even saw it coming. They have binocular vision. They can see over a mile away a little rodent running on the ground. And, and when you see their eyes, that's amazing. They have these piercing eyes. They live to be a great age. Some have lived to 120 years. This is, no, this is a fact. This is not a uh, fable. But also, eagles are known because they soar above the storm. And eagles don't fly. They don't just fly. They soar, right? They, they run. They, they float on heat thermals leisurely in defiance of the storm. And when that storm hits, man, that eagle just mounts up and, and, and rises and, and goes above the storm. So this kind of hope that I'm talking to you about is not flighty. It's not casual. It's not tenuous in any way. But it's the kind of hope that will bring you through any circumstances because it is rooted in the God of hope. Like the eagle, God has given you the power to soar above the storm. He's given you the power to be quick and, and to see, to have vision and to see and to be dexterous and to be agile. He's given you that power. And when I say that, I mean in a spiritual sense to navigate all the things you have to navigate in life. Because sometimes we, we are... We're called to be an eagle, but we're living more like a chicken on, on the ground. Don't we? You know, we're pecking and scratching on the ground. And I will end the series with a story that a true story that dealt with that. But if our hope is rooted in anything else other than God, then we don't have the right kind of hope. If our hope is only on the circumstances of life, if our hope is only on what may happen and that I'll finally be happy when I have closure, then that's not real hope because real hope is in the Lord. That's why it says those who hope in the Lord. And and the word hope and the word wait are, they're together. They work together, right? They're similar. And they're almost the same thing in a way. But if we don't root ourselves in the right kind of hope, then we'll be disappointed because all other hopes in the world are fleeting. Only the God of hope can get us through where we need to be. So in part two of this series, we're going to delve into the fact that real hope is a process, not simply a positive attitude. Sometimes people think, well, just hope for the best and that'll be enough. No, no, no. With God, hope is a, is a powerful process that, that we have to walk through. So if you like this podcast, leave a like and uh, check us out on, <clears throat> excuse me, check us out on our, uh, on the places where we where we are here, where we, let, let me get it up on here. But uh, we are on on YouTube. We are on Buzzsprout, Spotify, Google Podcast, and Facebook. Check us out, leave a like, and, um, and recommend it to a friend. And so next time we're going to be talking about, about this idea that, that, uh, that hope is more than just 
and attitude. So until next time, thank you so much for being with us and God bless you.